Generally, when you like a wrestling company, it's good to be able to see your champion. Certainly over the past two years or so in the WWE, there is one championship belt that's not often been seen every week on TV, that being the Universal Championship. Usually because it's been in the hands of Resident Conqueror, Beast Incarnate, former UFC Champion and so on and so on, Brock Lesnar. It does have to be said that for all a million or so other problems with the WWE products right now, it is at least nice to have Seth Rollins there, holding a belt, every Monday. Ah, wait. Turns out I wrote this and about 90% of this video before this happened at Extreme Rules last Sunday. Well, never mind. There's just something about Brock Lesnar. You just can't quit him, can you? Certainly the WWE can't. No matter how much people may question his motivation, or how often he shows up, or the quality of his work when he gets there, Brock Lesnar is still the man on top. Not that the Lesnar era doesn't produce anything good at all. He's got Paul Heyman alongside him, who's never not good. He has a certain aura that nobody else has. And if you get yourself a motivated Brock along with a good opponent, well, magic can still ensue. Those matches against AJ Styles, Daniel Bryan and Finn Balor? Bloody brilliant. Hell, even the series with Goldberg was quite literally as good as it could possibly have been. Maybe, just maybe, now he's retired from MMA he'll actually appear a lot more. But of course, when Lesnar's unmotivated and clearly not caring about anything except money, you get a load of crap. Just ask Samoa Joe or Dean Ambrose about that. But still, if you're a fan of Japanese wrestling, you might remember an even worse time when Brock was at the top of a company. Brock may at times be an unmotivated bastard in a WWE ring, but it is nothing compared to his time as New Japan's IWGP Heavyweight Champion. A time when Brock's motivation was questioned even more, he was hated by everyone in the back, and the company he was brought in to save was virtually at death's door. So let's take a look back to a time when everything that you currently know now, NJPW being amazing, glorious and prosperous, is basically wrong. How did Brock get to the top of New Japan, and why did it turn out to be so terrible? Let's find out. New Japan Pro Wrestling, today, is arguably the best wrestling company in the world. The quality of their shows for the past few years is unbelievable. The technical standard is off the charts, and now that the world is ever more linked up, more and more people worldwide know just how good New Japan is. But it wasn't always like this. In 2005, New Japan weren't even the best company in Japan. They were far from it. In fact, they were closer to the worst. The quality of their shows was inconsistent at best, hideous at worst, and they made decisions that frankly boggled the mind. The New Japan of 2005 is in many ways a completely different company to the one that exists now. So who's the man in charge? Well, it's the Chin himself. Antonio Inoki, the most popular wrestler in Puro history and founder of New Japan, has a very specific vision for pro wrestling, that pro wrestling and martial arts should commingle. This has been a defining characteristic of Inoki's career both as a wrestler and an owner. His infamous matchup with Muhammad Ali, or pushing a whole load of legit Russian amateur wrestlers in the late 80s with varying results. At its best, it created New Japan's house style, that being strong style. Now how does this differ from others like Kins Road? Well, the matches are often shorter, but there's more of an explosive, legit fight feel about them, although the moves themselves are usually still very much wrestling moves. It's not submissions and strikes like shoot style is. Strong style is pretty damn good at its best, resulting in amazing programs like the original New Japan vs UWF feud, but at the turn of the millennium, Inoki wanted to take it even further, and the result of this was something that came to be known as Inokiism. The principle of Inokiism is a simple one. We will have MMA fighters in pro wrestling matches, and pro wrestlers in MMA matches. The two principles will be intertwined, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? The ball really got rolling on January 4th 1999 at the annual Tokyo Dome show. Shinya Hashimoto, New Japan's top star of the 1990s, takes on legit Olympic level judoka Naya Ogawa in the main event. They've been feuding for a long time and this is the rubber match. And, well, it goes on. Ogawa shoots on Hashimoto, legitimately using his skills to thoroughly outmatch him and bloody him up. This lasts for seven minutes until both wrestlers' crews flood the ring and a legitimate all-out brawl ensues, resulting in a no contest. And you know what the crazy thing is? 
Ogawa was ordered to shoot on Hashimoto by Antonio Inoki, and Inoki didn't tell Hashimoto about it. It's crazy enough that Inoki sends wrestlers out to fight in MMA matches with little bit of fighting spirit slap to guide them, but he would also send them out to shoot fights without even telling them. Hashimoto's positioning in New Japan as a legit fighter and main eventer was damaged a bit by the beating he took from Ogawa. In many ways he wasn't really the same afterwards, although the Hashimoto and Ogawa feud and matches were insanely lucrative and something a lot of Japanese people would remember for years to come. Eventually, after losing a final retirement match against Ogawa in 2000, he set off to form his own promotion called Zero One. Now, funnily enough, the initial aim for Zero One was actually concocted by Hashimoto and Inoki as a way to temporarily get Hashimoto away from New Japan and build him back up before a triumphant return. However, the two eventually clash over the direction they want wrestling to take, and the worked break from New Japan turns into a legit one when the board votes to fire Hashimoto, who does not step a foot into a New Japan win again. There's a lot more detail to be looked at here another day. Other wrestlers are also turned off by the rise of Inokiism. New Japan built aces like Satoshi Kojima and the almighty Keiji Muto jump ship to All Japan, not wanting to be a part of it. Ricky Choshu, a wrestling legend, New Japan's booker for much of the 90s glory period and a kind of a polarising figure in the back, think of him as like the Japanese Dusty Rhodes, is ultimately forced out. Other great figures like Masahiro Chono and Kensuke Sasaki try to grin and bear it, at least for a time. The most infamous side of Inokiism is, of course, pro wrestlers getting thrown to the wolves in MMA matches. Many talents were crushed in the process. Folks like Yuji Nagata, an awesome wrestler, a company ace, who gets pummeled by frickin' Krokop and Fyodor. However, a few wrestlers actually did benefit from Inokiism. Tadeo Yasuda, an ex-sumo, perennial mid-carder and generally lousy wrestler, won a fight against Jerome Libana and was immediately propelled to the heavyweight title scene despite being bloody awful. Kazuyuki Fujita started out as a pretty so-so prospect in wrestling, then he got a whole bunch of wins in MMA and became a marketable talent in both MMA and New Japan. And what about Yoshihiro Takayama? Takayama was a really good hand in general, but a mid-carder before MMA. He had four fights in the early 2000s and didn't win any of them. However, one of them was against Don Fry, and this happened. Takayama lost, but this was one of the craziest and most insane things to ever happen in well, anywhere to be honest. The Takayama Fry bout turned him into a superstar, and his own brilliant skill as a wrestler made Takayama one of the biggest and best Japanese wrestlers of the decade. But the wrestler who benefited the most, particularly for the stage he was at in his career, was unquestionably a young man named Shinsuke Nakamura. He debuted in August of 2002, and then started fighting in MMA just a few months later, ultimately earning a 4 and 1 record with one no contest. Nakamura's relative success in MMA propelled him to the top of the card despite his young age. He was already part of a group that had become known unofficially as the New Three Musketeers, alongside fellow youngsters Hiroshi Tanahashi and Katsuyori Shibata, and named after the original Musketeer trio of Hashimoto, Chono and Muto. But his MMA success meant that he then became known as the Super Rookie, winning the IWGP Heavyweight title after only just over a year in the business, which is basically unheard of. Occasionally, the quality of his matches belied his lack of experience, particularly his bouts with Takayama and with Tanahashi. He clearly had lots of potential. Still, did crowds react well to Nakamura being pushed so hard? Or guys like Yasuda and Fujita? Ugh. Gradually, the crowds got very annoyed by it. One of the troubles with these new musketeers was because they, particularly Nak, got pushed so hard and so soon, a whole generation of popular main eventers kind of got skipped over. These were popular guys, and a lot of the crowd felt they deserved better. Guys like Yuji Nagata, Hiroyoshi Tenzan, and Manabu Nakanishi. Some of them certainly had success, plenty of title runs and G1 Climax tournament wins, but they'd never actually carried the company, they'd never been aces. And Inoki, well, he kind of passed them over. Nakamura bore the brunt of a lot of this ire. Tanahashi didn't do MMA, and certain things like recovering from getting stabbed by his ex-girlfriend helped his popularity, 
and Shibata didn't really make it into the main event before leaving New Japan to try his hand at his own shoot style promotion, Big Mouth Loud, followed by a full on MMA career. Also, well, if you're used to the Kin of Strong style that's generally rocked audiences over the past few years, that guy's not here yet. The Nakamura of the mid 2000s is an utterly different and far more generic, even boring personality. Very talented in the ring, but missing something. Hell, no one thought he had any charisma at all. It's hard to think of a bigger contrast between stages of a wrestler's career than the ban average and kinda dull Nakamura with a legit background that Inoki pushed way harder than he should have been, and the swaggering, ludicrously talented superstar he would become in later years. But as the 2000s wore on, Inokiism really began to take its toll. The people who liked pro wrestling found themselves unsatisfied by New Japan's generally short main events and occasional bouts of just what the hellishness. MMA fans, they weren't impressed either. Why watch this weird in the middle thing when they could just go and watch Pride or K1? Crowds were down. The average Tokyo Dome show, one that New Japan would happily expect to fill with 50,000 fans in the 90s, now barely achieved half of that number. The 2005 January 4th Dome show, with a shoot style Ultimate Royal won by MMA fighter Ron Waterman, Nakamura vs Tanahashi on top, and no heavyweight title on the card at all, was a nadir. The 55,000 seater Dome played host to an audience of 25,000, with only 10,000 of those paid. With wrestling approaching a real downturn, New Japan were in a very bad position. The product was so bad, as well as the interest in it, that pundits like Dave Meltzer were comparing it to WCW in the year 2000. That's how bad it was. But then, the opportunity came to grab some major publicity, and someone who could potentially turn things around. After a lousy match with Goldberg at WrestleMania 20 put an end to his time in WWE, Brock Lesnar, as we know, tried to pursue an NFL dream, in his words just so that he was able to know if he could have made it there or not. It could have gone better perhaps, he was drafted by the Minnesota Vikings, but was then cut in pre-season. Who knows how much a motorcycle accident had to do with that, more than Lesnar let on probably, but his career in the NFL was very short lived. So where to next? He could have easily gone back to the WWE of course, that would be what most would have expected him to do. But in Brock's words, even the two years he spent as a full time WWE main event star, pretty much a constant at the top of the card in those times, had left him pissed off at backstage politics, badly beaten up in his body, and on the verge of a painkillers and vodka addiction. Besides which, well, nearly everybody hated him there. It appeared as though he had no desire to go back to that. Indeed, public comments he'd made about how wrestling was fake and sport was the real deal seemed to burn that particular bridge for good. Still, with no aspirations towards MMA at this moment, pro wrestling was for now still a good earner for him. But Brock would rather do it on his own terms, and a punishing WWE style schedule was not for him. But how did he end up in Japan? Well, naturally, it's a roller coaster story filled with lawsuits, vicious political wranglings, and plenty of good old fashioned wrestling. First up, a chance meeting way back. As the story goes, Lesnar first met Antonio Inoki in what would probably be around 2000 or so, not three weeks into his pro wrestling training under Brad Rangans, who also happened to be New Japan's American booker charged with winning Gai Jin's in for tours. Fresh faced and just out of collegiate wrestling, Inoki pops round to Rangans' place one day, is introduced to Lesnar, and then they start a friendly amateur shoot in Lorin, apparently wrestling for over an hour and a half. Inoki may have been nearly 60, but he was still in good shape, and as the story comes from Lesnar's own mouth circa about 2004, and he barely even knew who Inoki was at the time, perhaps it's actually not a complete fabrication. As it goes, Lesnar ends up signing with the WWF in 2000, but the connection has been made. A few years later, with Lesnar having washed out of the NFL, Antonio Inoki starts making some noise in public about Brock Lesnar, teasing that he's going to be making an appearance at the 2005 Dome Show, you know, that same one that nobody attended. For once, Inoki isn't actually bullshitting. New Japan have been talking to Brock, and he will be making an appearance. In the crowd. Brock Lesnar does show up with his wife-to-be, Reina Miro, watches the Ultimate Royal, <laughs> you poor bastard Brock, and then does some interviews. Inoki had naturally teased that Lesnar might make his presence felt in a more physical way on the show, 
but this was never in question thanks to the non-compete clause Lesnar signed on his way out of WWE. The clause stated that Lesnar was not permitted to use his athletic talents for any form of either pro wrestling or shoot fighting until the middle of 2010, the time that the seven year contract he'd signed with the company in 2003 would have won out. In order for this to go away in WWE's eyes, Lesnar's either going to have to wait it out, or a company who wants him will have to buy it out. And WWE, well, they don't particularly want to make that deal with anyone. With Lesnar's NFL hopes dashed, he's not made much in the way of actual money, one of his other desires, over the past nine months, and now that he's appearing in New Japan, if only in the crowd, it seems inevitable that Lesnar's going to see whether or not that clause is going to hold up in the courts. Inevitably, in February, Lesnar takes WWE to the courts, wanting out of the no-compete clause and attempting to prove that it's illegitimate. Obviously it's pretty easy to sympathise with Brock here, and he most definitely has a solid case considering the length of the clause. It might just be seen as unreasonable and damaging to the man's prospects, you know? WWE kinda know that Lesnar has a legitimate case too, but they have endless resources, and Lesnar doesn't. They can try and string this out in the courts for as long as it takes for Brock to run out of the money needed to fight it. Still, if Brock can weather that, he can certainly make the case that this no-compete clause is unprecedented, which it was, and that it would take his prime years as an athlete entirely away from him. As the case enters a discovery phase, scuppering any hope of a summary judgement for either party, it makes sense for both sides to make some more overtures to each other, particularly as it looks more and more like a case the WWE can't win, but also a case that could potentially take a long time to settle. Brock makes some conciliatory statements about wanting to potentially return to the WWE, and in July the E breaks the IWC by publishing a picture of Brock arriving at Titan Towers on their website. However, once again they just fail to get on the same page. It's not happening. If Lesnar had come back, it's pretty well known that he'd have immediately entered a main event programme with Batista, but money and dates again proved to be the sticking point. Oh, and Lesnar was also in much more serious negotiations with New Japan. Things come to a head on September the 13th. All of a sudden, New Japan star Masahiro Chono announces that Brock Lesnar will be wrestling on the October 4th Tokyo Dome show. This is big, not to mention confusing. No, the case between Lesnar and WWE isn't over, even if it's now looking likelier to be a win for Lesnar. WWE have failed and will continue to fail in any attempt to stop him, and Brock being Brock it seems like he's just going to ignore it anyway. The expectation immediately is that Lesnar will become the biggest star in the company. His first match is likely to be against IWGP champ Kazuyuki Fujita for the belt, and you wouldn't bet against him winning. With this particular dome show looking like another financial bomb from the advancers, it's hoped that the arrival of Lesnar will kickstart business. Ultimately, there's little WWE can really do, so long as Brock doesn't do certain WWE trademark things. He can't wear black wrestling shorts, he can't call himself the next big Finn, and he can't call his finisher the F5. Not exactly a big deal, really. And so, Lesnar's coming back to wrestling. And who boy would soon wish he hadn't. Sure enough, Brock Lesnar, in his first match with New Japan, wins the IWGP Heavyweight Championship in the main event of the October the 4th Dome Show, defeating Kazuyuki Fujita and Masahiro Chono. New Japan don't usually run triple threat bouts like this, but the match was changed a bit from the initial Lesnar-Fujita bout for a couple of reasons. Fujita, the champion, was working with an injury from MMA, limiting him even more than usual. The guy wasn't all that good at wrestling, to be honest. And they wanted to keep him strong. I mean, seriously, Fujita was massively protected as an unstoppable monster, Goldberg style. Masahiro Chono is a very popular veteran main event talent who won the 2005 G1 Climax against Vegeta in emotional fashion as a tribute to his late friend Shinya Hashimoto, who passed away suddenly in July. As over as he is, he can absorb a pinfall loss. The match is… okay. It's about as average as you would expect for a guy who's not wrestled in 18 months, a legend who's kind of banned up and past his prime, and an overpushed dude who often acts like he's still green. It's mostly Lesnar's showcases of strength as he easily overpowers Chono and Fujita, although Suplex City hadn't quite been built yet. It's a very simple triple threat, one that seems like it was laid out to the letter. 
As I said, these matches are rare in Japanese wrestling. Eventually Lesnar's just too much for both of them. He hits Vegeta and then Chono with his newly named finisher, The Verdict. An obvious shot fired at the WWE and his case, before taking his prize, being congratulated by Brad Rangans and Charlie Haas, posing with Inoki and generally acting like the new top dog. Lesnar is an obvious heel, the kin of the foreign monsters, and he's won the big title immediately. I'm not sure what people were talking about more in the aftermath though. His victory, or that bloody awful sword tattoo that looks kinda like a penis which he also debuted during this bout. Bad tattoos aside, Lesnar's victory and reign comes during a time of general change. While his addition to the October 4th card didn't drive much in the way of business, playing out to another not even half full Tokyo Dome, he is clearly positioned as the company's new top star. A new era comes with a new belt. When Kazuyuki Fujita won the IWGP belt in July, it was days after the death of Hashimoto, again the company's biggest star of the 1990s. Symbolically, Fujita left the old IWGP heavyweight title in front of a picture of Hashimoto and walked to the back without it. This belt is now Hashimoto's forever. A new belt, engraved with the names of all previous IWGP champions, made its debut a few days later. But none of these are the biggest change. In November, the video game company Yooks, yes the guys who make the WWE games, purchase Antonio Inoki's controlling stake in the company. Inoki will for the time being remain a figurehead and someone with lots of influence, especially as Yuke stick with his son-in-law Simon Inoki as company president, but he is no longer the owner of the company. Many people are, needless to say, hopeful that this signals an end, or at least the beginning of the end, of the dark days of Inokiism. In the meantime, it is time to establish Lesnar and get him in the ring. In December he has two non-title main event matches during the year-end battle final tour as a prelude to his first actual title defence which will be on the January 4th 2006 Dome Show against Shinsuke Nakamura. Up first, on the 10th of December, is Manabu Nakanishi. Nakanishi, who you may recall wrestled as Kurosawa for WCW in the mid 90s, actually has a pretty cool sprint with Brock. The two work fast, we get a whole bunch of suplexes, a little bit of storytelling even as Lesnar distracts himself with Nakamura inside, and a surprising amount of offence from Nakanishi including his finisher, the torture rack, before Lesnar hits a powerbomb and follows with the verdict for a win in under 5 minutes. Fun little match. The very next day, Lesnar faces Yuji Nagata. Ah, Blue Justice. One of New Japan's best ever wrestlers, and at this time one of those who endlessly got screwed the most by Inokiism, as if you needed reminding. Anyway, this one's even better. Nagata brings the fire and actually manages to get Lesnar down, going to town with kicks, a shining wizard, and a backdrop. Lesnar plays the usual monster role, but does a good job of being the monster in a bit of peril too before hitting a short time clothesline, followed by the verdict for the win. It's another short match at only around 8 minutes, but it is an ok strong style match, and short main events happened fairly often back in these days of New Japan. This would certainly be satisfying at events like these, mind you. It's when they happened in the Tokyo Dome that people usually had problems. Speaking of the Tokyo Dome, that was Lesnar's next destination, the January 4th show against Shinsuke Nakamura, who'd been ardently watching both of Lesnar's matches in preparation for taking on the wrestling machine. Nakamura was not the first choice for this slot. That would have been a clash of unstoppable monsters, a bout between Lesnar and Kazuyuki Fujita. This was clearly the plan at the end of the match where Lesnar won the belt, with Fujita loudly shouting that Lesnar hadn't pinned him, the champion, in order to win his title. However, that triple threat would be Fujita's last match for the company. On December the 8th, he told New Japan that he was pulling out of the Dome Show, forcing the head booker, the recently returned Riki Choshu, to rush Nakamura into the slot with little build up beforehand. Fujita was able to pull out with no explanation for a simple reason. He wasn't actually under contract to New Japan. He'd signed a contract with Inoki International, a side company owned by Antonio Inoki, who then negotiated his dates with New Japan. This wouldn't normally be a problem, but of course Antonio Inoki no longer owns New Japan. It's perfectly possible that the decision to basically pull Fujita from the company came from him, and he held them up for way too much money. It's a cutthroat business, in case you needed reminding. 
The Lesnar Nakamura match itself is good, but it's also another short one. Nakamura does get a few nice spots here and there, mostly with his submission based offence, there's a bunch of armbar attempts and all that. It's fine, although this again is way, way different from the Nakamura people are used to seeing these days. Lesnar again does an okay job of selling Nakamura's desperation offence. He's obviously getting much more offence in, but he can sell being in peril. Generally, he's looked good so far, but you just wish the matches were a bit longer and that it felt like Lesnar was putting in a bit more effort. But due to the nature of his booking as a no-nonsense beast, the matches tend to be short, and sure enough, after about 8 minutes, Lesnar once again prevails with the verdict. Given a lot more time, this match could have been really good, instead of just okay. What's also worthy of note is that Nakamura, in his 2018 biography, was very negative on this match. He felt that it wasn't all that it could have been, and that he felt Lesnar didn't have much love for pro wrestling, just paying lip service to it and New Japan. He said it was the first time that he cried after having a pro wrestling match. Once again, even with Lesnar established on the top, the January 4th Dome show was another lousy performer, at least in terms of tickets. Around 30,000 in attendance, but again only 10,000 or so paid. One saving grace for the company was excellent merchandise sales, which gave them hope that they'd still at least be able to run the annual Dome show next year. Lesnar was looking good physically, even if he'd hardly kicked into top gear in his performances, but he was not as yet attracting immediate bumps to seats. This despite WWE's protest enduring various failed injunctions to stop him performing that whenever Lesnar set foot in the New Japan ring, it caused irreparable damage to the WWE's business. But any wranglings in the courtroom seem to be irrelevant to the path that Lesnar and New Japan takes, and following a tag match where he teamed with Shinsuke Nakamura to fight Riki Choshu and his next opponent, he moves on to his next defence on March the 19th at Sumo Hall against Aki Bono. This is another match that wasn't exactly planned way in advance, but the heat that Lesnar drew in his interactions with Aki Bono in the tag match made New Japan think that this would be a big money bout. So this match should be different. Akebono is, of course, a sumo legend, a former Yokozuna. Since retiring, he's done a lot of spots in various places – MMA, kickboxing, and pro wrestling. Hell, he even appeared at WrestleMania in 2005 for a sumo match against The Big Show. He's a big celebrity and all that, although he has no training in anything but sumo. But this is his home turf. Akebono has had many of his best sporting moments right here in Sumo Hall. But this match with Lesnar is… well, look, it's not terrible, it could have been a lot worse. But it is certainly heavily laid out and Akibono gasses after about a minute or so. He is after all a legit 500 pounder. Lesnar takes a lot of offence here, usually due to Akibono falling on him, and this match features another rarity for New Japan in these days, a big ref bump. During Tiger Hattori's downtime, Akebono manages to get visual free counts on Lesnar, but also gets hit by a belt shot, much to the eye of what is a pretty hot crowd. The end of the match comes suddenly. Lesnar hits a DDT pretty much out of nowhere, and this is enough for the free count in a match that again goes about 8 minutes. The finish is deflating for the crowd. This was billed as a big fight encounter, with New Japan even showing footage of Hulk Hogan taking on Andre the Giant in Japan, mind you, as a way of hyping up this match as a similar confrontation. One big hype point would be if Brock Lesnar could F uh, put the verdict on Akibono. He tries a couple of times, but he couldn't do it, and indeed, he doesn't. Apparently this is due to Akibono having fights coming up and not being willing to take the F5 bump. The match itself is, at best, passable, all things considered, but the finish is utterly lame. The next challenge for Lesnar comes on May the 3rd, when he faces the winner of the 2006 New Japan Cup, and a guy he knows quite well already. Giant Bernard. Better known as Albert, or A-Train in WWE before this, often told to shave his back, and once a part of the greatest stable in the history of professional wrestling. In all seriousness, however, this matchup that once may possibly have headlined a weekly Smackdown TV show in 2003 is quite an interesting one, mainly because of the contrast between the two. Brock has come storming into New Japan, is presumably being paid a cack ton of money, and won the top belt in literally his first match. 
Giant Bernard hardly received all that much love throughout his WWE career, but since his release in November 2004, he's worked his ass off both for All Japan and now for New Japan to the point where Japan is now his home turf. He's never missed a tour, he's been in plenty of good matches, and has become a much better worker overall than he ever was in WWE. Oh, and he's even shaved his back! Brock kinda gets everything handed him on a plate, but Giant Bernard has definitely earned his way to the New Japan Cup, and this shot at the title that comes with it. Again, we have a different sort of match here. In Bernard, Lesnar has an opponent who can match his power, and so we get plenty of big and beefy heavyweight exchanges. An important historical note here is that this is the first IWGP Heavyweight Championship match to take place between two American opponents in 16 years, with the last one being between Stan Hansen and Vader in 1990. Now obviously this match can't lace that one's boots, but it's not bad if you like big lumps going toe to toe. Another note is that Lesnar does seem to be moving a bit towards a submission style here, with lots of working of the arm and more general wrestling as opposed to strikes and power moves. Part of this is due to Bernard's injured arm being an obvious target, but there is perhaps another reason from outside which we won't go into yet. For now this match is a fairly enjoyable one in my view. Bernard gets some of his own big moves in, manages to thwart Lesnar from time to time, and generally gets a bit more than the desperation offence that a lot of Lesnar's other challenges have had. But ultimately, it's not enough. Sooner or later, before you know it, Lesnar's got him up on the shoulders. Verdict, free count, Lesnar takes out another. At 14 and a half minutes, it's his longest singles bout in New Japan to date. Visiting with the media after the match, Lesnar seems more than a little annoyed at the quality of his opposition. He says that he'll be champion forever until New Japan can find someone that's a serious opponent for him. And to be fair, in storyline terms, no one has yet to cut the mustard. Nakamura pretty much got wiped, Akibono jobbed to a DDT, Bernard wasn't in his league in the WWE, and he isn't now either. Lesnar has won all of his matches in pretty decisive fashion. So, who can beat him? Is there any ace out there who's got what it takes? Some sort of incredibly rare, once in every hundred years talent? Well, perhaps we'll find that out soon. Or alternatively, we won't. Brock Lesnar's next opponent would be another one of the new Three Musketeers, perhaps the one who was the most popular of all with the crowd, particularly the younger members of it. Hiroshi Tanahashi. The matchup of him against Lesnar is an interesting one. So, you know, um, it's a shame that it never ended up happening. Between the announcement of the match and bell time on July 17th, the bottom would utterly fall out of the Lesnar and New Japan relationship. One important thing to note is that on April the 24th, 2006, the case between WWE and Lesnar finally came to a close with a settlement out of court. The exact terms aren't known, but it freed Lesnar up to do most things. Certainly there'd be no further trouble with him working New Japan, but more importantly, it freed him up for MMA. This was now where his head was at. He felt that he could be pretty successful in shoot fighting, and he'd been talking to K1 about working for them and their new MMA spin-off, K1 Heroes. Lesnar publicly declared interest in working for them mere days after the ruling. This immediately made people think that Lesnar would soon be done with wrestling. He's here talking about getting into training and getting ready to fight and all that, and pro wrestling? Well, at best that's going to be a distraction. Here's how things had generally been working between Lesnar and New Japan. He was getting paid per appearance, reportedly around $50,000 a time. New Japan faxes over the contract, it gets signed, and the money is wired over before Brock even gets on a plane. Simple enough, right? I mean, it shouldn't be too difficult to snap this sort of agreement if both parties are willing. And that's the thing, both parties certainly were. New Japan had been sour on the Lesnar experiment for a while now, probably dating back to the Yakibono match. This was filled with drama because Lesnar wanted the finish of F5 in a verdict in Akebono, but the sumo wouldn't agree because he had legit fights coming up and he didn't want to get injured. This pissed Brock off, and he nearly walked out of New Japan Len and Lair, having to be virtually talked back into the building. Lesnar's reputation with the boys in the back was really not good after this. The feeling was that Akebono always busted his ass despite his rather limited skill set, whereas Lesnar was simply coming in once a month, making loads of money, and then phoning it in. 
He did nothing to ingratiate himself with anyone. He didn't even travel with the locker room, insisting on his own car and driver. Not that this should be surprising. Hell, he bought his own private plane when he was in WWE. Brock Lesnar just doesn't like other people. The locker room wanted Lesnar to drop the belt to Bernard on May 3rd, but Simon Inoki nixed it. They didn't think Bernard was popular enough, and wanted to wait until Lesnar faced Tanahashi on July 17th. If that match had happened, Tanahashi would have beaten Brock for the belt. This waiting proved to be an awful decision. Lesnar at this point basically had New Japan over a bowel. Simon Inoki was under massive pressure from Yukes, the rest of the board, literally everyone to drop Lesnar as soon as possible. He was costing so much money, and by this point he still wasn't moving the needle and actually putting bums on seats. With New Japan's finances well in the red, they can't afford his price. And in order to bring him over again, they're going to need to get his working visa resorted, as it'll expire after the Bernard match. It's an awkward situation. And of course, there is the small matter of that belt that Lesnar's holding. According to Brock's autobiography, Death Clutch, something of a scene played out at the airport with Brock waiting for his flight back. Simon Inoki rolls up and asks for the IWGP belt, insisting that they want to get it cleaned and looking pristine for his next appearance. Brock, who at this point hasn't actually been paid for this appearance, insists that he'll keep the belt and make sure that it gets cleaned, shined and looking all nice by himself. Simon insists, and of course he's got two of New Japan's burlier wrestlers with him. But Brock also insists that he'll be taking the belt home. And in the end, well, there's not exactly much Simon Inoki can do. This is a public airport. I mean, what are they going to do? Rough him up and cause a massive incident? New Japan president fights his champion in the departure lounge? And so, Lesnar gets on a plane, with the belt in tow. It's a rather dramatised version of the story perhaps, and one wonders how much of it is actually true, but in any case, Lesnar took the belt back home to, of course, get it cleaned up. It wasn't in any way collateral. Predictably, things go sour straight after that. Simon Inoki does make an attempt to renegotiate the price of Lesnar's appearances, which goes about as well as you'd expect it to. The relationship between Simon Inoki and Brock Lesnar turns into dust, and it's pretty clear that Brock will not be coming back. This is finally announced as late as July the 14th, mere days before the Sapporo show that was supposed to be headlined by Tanahashi and Lesnar. It's announced that the expired visa is the reason, but this alone would surely not be enough to not only announce Lesnar's no show, but immediately strip him of the belt. In the end, Tanahashi wins a six-man tournament for the now vacant IWGP heavyweight title. The show doesn't sell well, but it wouldn't have sold any better with Lesnar there either. And New Japan have to use the old version of the belt that they'd recently retired in her march to Shinya Hashimoto, because Lesnar's still getting that new belt cleaned. Yeah. So yeah, Simon Inoki lost the belt. As far as Brock's concerned, that belt's his now. As if Finns couldn't get any worse. There are other dimensions to play here, mind you, such as the K1 dimension. Lesnar and K1 are well into negotiations and are basically just waiting for a good time to announce it, which turned out to be August. Is it possible that K1 didn't want their new star losing a work to wrestling match just before said announcement? That's something to ponder. As for the feelings of the boys in the back, well, as you can imagine, they're quite negative towards Lesnar. This feeling is perhaps best summed up by Giant Bernard, who had this to say on a message board in the wake of Lesnar's departure. This is bullshit and it makes me sick. I hope you all don't turn your back on New Japan, because day in and day out, every worker from top to bottom busts their asses to make you the fans happy. I have been able to work in many places, and this, by far, is my favourite, and I look at everyone here as family. I take pride in trying to make New Japan the best company in Japan. Whatever Brock's reason was, it will never be good enough for me, and it makes me sick. As I said before, this company is my home, and I am damn proud of it. So because one guy Jin fucked it up, don't let that shine a bad light on me or Tomko, his tag partner, the former Tyson Tomko, because we will bust out asses to make New Japan the best. This is one of those situations where basically both sides are to blame. Brock Lesnar, of course, acted very much like the type A personality he is. Hard to deal with, barely tolerates anybody, threw tantrums, then walked off. 
New Japan failed to manage him, completely screwed up by giving him all the power work for them, and frankly should never have hired him in the first place. The Brock Lesnar in New Japan one was an absolute fiasco and a financial disaster. The matches weren't bad or anything and Lesnar looked good, even if his actual effort was often questionable, but the presence of Brock in the end was not a ticket seller. A big part of this was because of the deep hole that New Japan was in. Brock Lesnar's failure to move the needle is not really an indictment of him as a top guy, it's an indictment of all the crap that the company had pulled over the past few years that had torn their reputation and their attendance to absolute shreds. This was a company in a bad way, and in the words of Dave Meltzer, Antonio Inoki's acquisition of Lesnar's talents was a Hail Mary. And at the end of it all, they had even less money to show for it, and they'd lost a brand new heavyweight championship belt. Not good. But still, the story isn't fully over yet. The Brock Lesnar part of this story is almost done, but we can't really end this without looking at what happened to that IWGP Championship. It's an important part of New Japan's recovery from this whole mess. So let's switch things up a bit. With business concluded between himself and New Japan, Lesnar sets about training for MMA and whoever his first opponent will be. Original word was that Bob Sapp was set to be Lesnar's opponent, but this fell by the wayside quickly. Eventually, in early 2007, the announcement is made that Brock Lesnar is set to fight the giant Korean kickboxing and wrestling monster 7'2 Honman Choi in the main event of Dynamite USA, K1 Heroes' first American card, on June the 2nd. In the meantime, however, an opportunity does come up to tie a loose end. Simon Inoki left his role as President of New Japan in March of 2007. He didn't exactly have an easy job of it at any time, but it's fair to say that he won't be missed. He goes to join his father-in-law at his brand new promotion, Inoki Genome Federation, which is set to be the new home for all Inokiism purists everywhere. Still, they wanted some sort of title fight for their first card, and even if Finns ended up getting sour between Simon and Brock in New Japan, Brock's always listening when there's money to be made. Eventually, negotiations are sorted for Lesnar to wrestle one match only. He will put his IWGP Championship on the line, the one recognised as the Championship by IGF, on their debut show. The only condition is that this match cannot take place before Lesnar's first MMA fight. And so, Lesnar has that fight, against a Korean amateur wrestler named Min Soo Kim, who he beats in about a minute. The bout between him and Honman Choi had been called off weeks ago, as US medics wouldn't clear Choi because of a tumour on his pituitary glands. Mind you, this didn't stop K1 advertising Lesnar vs Choi as the main event until literally the day of the fight because, well, they're scummy like that. Just a couple of weeks later, Lesnar main events the first IGF show on June 29th. His opponent? Kurt Angle. Angle, then wrestling for TNA, who are perfectly willing to do business here, was pretty much hand-picked by Lesnar as his opponent. If this was going to be the end for him in wrestling, and to just about everyone it seemed like that was going to be the case, he didn't want to lose to just anybody, and Angle was one of the very few people in wrestling who Lesnar considered to be a friend. Considering that Angle was also the guy he headlined WrestleMania and probably had his best feud with, in the end after a twisted and screwed up route, it makes sense for Kurt Angle to be the guy who takes Brock Lesnar out of pro wrestling for good, even if you'd have probably thought it would be the other way around. For Angle's part, he wishes to return the favour by fighting Lesnar in an MMA bout somewhere in the future which for various reasons never actually ends up happening. As you might expect, Lesnar and Angle have a fantastic match. It's a perfectly even bout all the way through, with both of them giving each other their best shots. Lesnar hasn't looked this motivated in years. The IGF crowd get into the whole thing pretty quickly too. They're still hot for Lesnar, and Angle's talent is unquestionable, even if this is the first time he's wrestled in Japan on a non-WWE card. The crowd pops big when Angle kicks out of the verdict, a move that nobody kicked out of in New Japan. After this, Habris gets the better of Lesnar. He tries to finish Angle with Angle's own finisher, the ankle lock. However, Angle reverses it into his own ankle lock and Brake finds the leg, leaving Brock with no choice but to tap out. Angle wins the IGF version of the IWGP Championship, and Brock leaves pro wrestling. At the time, most thought that would be for good, although in the end it turned out to be for five years. The 2007 match with Angle remains the last time that Brock lost a wrestling match via submission.
This is kind of a hidden gem of a match, a really good one between a solid pairing that, at the time, was overshadowed by other events. It occurred days after the Benoit murder-suicide. I highly recommend it, especially if you are a fan of Lee's two going at it. The IWGP belt is primarily used as a prop for the angle that TNA were currently running with uh, Angle, in which he was basically the champion of the whole company, at one point holding every belt at once. As the angle played out though, the IWGP belt appeared less and less before pretty much not being mentioned at all, and before long enough TNA and New Japan were setting up a business relationship of their own. This ultimately led to global impact and TNA becoming a big part of the next couple of January the 4th Dome shows, but it also gave New Japan the opportunity to get their championship belt back. TNA had no problem with this, seeing as they weren't exactly using said belt. Angle had only defended it the once against Samoa Joe in the winner-take-all bout at Hard Justice. And so, on the January 4th 2008 Dome show, Kurt Angle faced Yuji Nagata in a pretty textbook definition of a dream match, for what was now being called the IWGP third belt. And in a pretty damn good match all told, Angle defended the title. Once again, alas, Blue Justice just couldn't get it done. Someone a bit younger was needed to do the job. On the same night, Shinsuke Nakamura defeated Hiroshi Tanahashi for the IWGP Heavyweight Championship, still the previously retired version of the belt. Not long after his loss to Lesnar, Nakamura took what most promising youngsters tend to do, a foreign excursion, something that he never had the chance to do because he was pushed to the moon so early on. He came back a much more complete wrestler, with more than just solid technical skills to him. And after Angle's victory against Nagata, Nakamura came straight in to challenge Angle, champion versus champion, in a unification bout. The two faced off at the Sumo Hall on February the 17th. It's another damn good bout indeed, with Angle playing much more of a heel this time. A lot of it is based in submissions, as you might expect with these two. So many times it seems like Nak's right on the brink of giving up. The Olympic Slam or the Landslide respectively aren't enough for either to go down, one of them is going to have to tap out. But finally, Nakamura secures a flying armbar. Angle struggles valiantly, but eventually Nakamura is able to extend the arm, and Angle has no choice but to tap. Nakamura has done it. He has reclaimed the third belt for New Japan Pro Wrestling. The match as it goes is an incredibly important one in the recent history of the company, and in Nakamura's redemption arc, from the kinda overpushed rookie that he once was, to the full wrestler and near total package that he now is. The match made him a hero in the eyes of New Japan's fans for bringing the important belt back home, and it finally allowed New Japan to retire the second title for good. Not long after this, it would be officially presented to Shinya Hashimoto's son Daichi, who later became a wrestler in his own right. Kurt Angle shows respect to Nakamura after the win, and Shinsuke also ends up on Giant Bernard's big shoulders. But also, just look at the young lion talent that's in the ring. Nakamura is hugged by a young Irishman by the name of Prince Devitt. He has the belt strapped around his waist by a young, dark-haired Kazuchika Okada, and an almost unrecognisable Tetsuya Naito places one of the many trophies next to him. The future of the company is right here in the ring, and it's looking bright. Nakamura's victory represents the end of this story, but it also represents the beginning of a much better era for New Japan Pro Wrestling. The misery endured by the company during the years of Enochism and the reign of Lesnar, even if that's hardly the fault of Brock himself, was an important part of this turnaround, and New Japan probably wouldn't be the company they are today if they hadn't peered over the very edge of the cliff. Bye for now.